Uh, welcome to What awesome. It Takes to Create. Hey, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, so, Karan, uh, before we get started, uh, we will start with your introduction. Uh, could you tell okay. uh, two or three lines about yourself? Okay. Um, so, hey, everybody. My name is Karan, and I am a producer in the Master Game Studio at the University of Utah, as well as a podcast host. Great. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, I uh, know you from uh, like because we are in the same university, and uh, you are uh, my actually senior for two years, I guess. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> like, we know about uh, game engineers, game designers, game artists, but game producers for me are the unsung heroes of the game development. Could you tell us what's a game producer? Is what's the role of a game producer? Okay, um, so to put it in an easy way, I would say a game producer is sort of a facilitator. Um, a lot of people have this uncommon, um, you know, idea in their head saying that, okay, a producer is somebody like a boss, but um, that's not true. A producer is as equal as an engineer or uh, any other developer <clears throat> in the game. But um, the producer is a person who is there all throughout the process of the development of the project. So right from the starting of the idea initiation till the end where the project is delivered, a producer is involved in multiple roles between them. So I would say that um, the role of a producer is not very de definite because it just requires you to be across multiple stages of the development phase. But uh, to put it in a uh, much better way, I would say a producer is a person who has to manage the project um, I would say in terms of, you know, setting the goals, uh, ensuring that, you know, the, the vision holders requirements are met within the given time. So um, let me say, so in my uh, lab where I work at, we have uh, these things called sprints. Those are two week development cycles, essentially. So within those two week development cycles, we gather requirements and then we work to ensure that we have the product or, you know, the goal that the client had for us in mind. So a producer's job is to, you know, make sure that the tasks are there and communicate between teams to ensure that, you know, there is no blockage for either an artist or an engineer who's working on the project and just to make sure that oh, the overall process is flowing smoothly. Wow, that sounds like a lot of work. Like you are the connection point of all the engineers, artists, designers, like you are in the middle point. Yeah, you could say that for sure. Yeah. All right. So like, uh, what's, what's it like to be a producer? What's a typical day for you? Like, uh, like being a producer and doing your work? Um, okay. So right now, uh, as I mentioned, I work at the research lab, uh, at the university of Utah. Uh, like, so uh, out there, the my, lab. yeah, it's called the therapeutic games and applications lab. So the gap lab. Uh, so my day starts off around nine o'clock, nine thirty in the morning where uh, we have stand up meetings every day. But then apart from that, like I mentioned earlier, we have these client meetings that take place once every two weeks. And essentially my role out there is to gather the information that we get as feedback and then work on that to set up the sprint goals. That is, you know, the at the end of every sprint, what we plan to deliver and also communicate with the lead engineers to get that sorted on who's going to work on what. And also doc, my day has a lot of documentation going on with it. So I work on documenting our iteration log and then, you know, just updating our milestone list. And apart from that, I personally like UI a lot. So I communicate with the UI engineer just to give my uh, UI designer just to give my ideas and to get that, you know, sorted and delivered the way just as we require. All right. Like, uh, as you have said, like, uh, it's, uh, you are mainly the connection point between all the stuff, but, uh, you have said that you like UI and, uh, I have seen that you have worked in uh, UX user experience in uh, various other projects. Uh, like, uh, I know you are from, uh, you are an engineer, like you did your BTEC from SRM university. Uh, so, uh, it's kind of like, most of the engineers go for masters in engineering, but you choose to be in a like uh, kind of like a product management space. Uh, like why this uh, like change? Like uh, why didn't you choose a game engineering? Like why game producer? Did you always wanted to be a producer or uh, you wanted to be a managerial position in game development industry? Um, okay, so there are a couple of questions in that, but uh, to start off, yes, I did uh, do my undergrad in software engineering at SRM. Um, so software engineering is a little bit different than the regular, you know, computer science engineering. So uh, apart from coding, we also did learn multiple stuff 
that is outside just coding ball. So we learned stuff like the software principles and then we learned about project management and then we did learn about multiple other stuff. So that did give me the exposure to think about a little bit more outside the coding world. And I, I honestly kind of like what I was doing out there in my undergrad. So, um, and uh, I had a chance to go to uh, UC Davis in my uh, undergrad as well. So out there, I did take up a course on uh, game platforms where I was exposed to this opportunity to, you know, handle the project as well as uh, pitch and deliver uh, stuff in front of the audience. So for me, I really, really like, um, you know, presenting in public and just getting out there. And to be honest, still, it's probably about a year before till I came here, I did not know that there was a specific role called a producer in the games industry. But, so I kind of was like, huh, should I take up game engineering? But then I did speak to a professor who helped me out at UC Davis. And then he kind of told me about the different roles that are there. And I thought that, you know, the role of a producer aligned with what I did most. And um, I also did an internship in my undergrad where I did handle the software or documentation and I did handle like, you know, direct client interaction and stuff, which I kind of really liked because I was at the forefront of the product itself and, you know, exposing myself to be a, probably a person who is responsible up front is kind of what I really liked at that time. So I was like, why not pursue it? So I just decided to become a producer. All right. Like uh, the main points I'm getting from that is that uh, you are really a people person. Like you want, want like to work with several kinds of people, like uh, talking with them, having them uh, setting to the right path. And uh, the, and I know that's for a fact that because it's it's too hard because doing engineering is one thing, but people are like it changes every second what's going in their mind and a huge project when it, there's a lots of pressure. How do you handle that? Um, yes, that is true. Um, it does take a lot of pressure because um, so you work with amazing people in a team always, but uh, you know, so there's something called scope, which is kind of like the, I would say the most feasible stuff that you can work at towards the end. So a scope is something that um, you set at the end for a project saying that, okay, within this given timeline, I can only achieve so much. But um, so one of the pressures that I do face uh, and the challenges I would say is that when I work with a team of like amazingly talented people, we have everybody throwing in ideas and, you know, as a producer, you kind of uh, have to be, uh, you have to step up at that point and say, okay, uh, we only have, let's say like, uh, so we work in like cycles of two weeks. So we only have like two weeks and at this, at the end of the two weeks, we need to make sure that we're able to deliver this. So it's kind of a, pressurized job in that way because you have to make sure that you're not discouraging anybody by turning down the ideas but also making sure that the team is going to be functioning well without you know any crunch time in the end so your task is communicating better in a in a better way to people but also i would say that one of the most challenging jobs is to just ensure that you are not putting anybody down or you know making anybody sad all right, like you, you are the person who makes the hard call and it's uh, kind of leaves you a uh, like scope that everyone might get mad at you because I know for a fact we engineers love to work on our ideas and we don't like uh, someone tell you cannot do this because we don't have time. That's the last thing we want to hear. That's actually true. Uh, I mean, it's. I, I, I honestly do feel bad, you know, when like oh, everybody in the team comes up with like brilliant ideas and towards the end, you're like, I don't think that that would be possible just because of the time frame that we have. But I mean, if we did have the time, it would have been lovely to implement. But just thinking that, you know, as a producer, you kind of think a little bit ahead into the future saying that, okay, I need to make sure that within this given timeline, how much of it can be done because you do not want the team to work uh, you know, outside their hours or crunch late at night. And, um, you know, just make, you just want to make sure that you have a complete product by the time you tell uh, by the time you have to deliver it and just make sure that all the whole process works smoothly. So there are that, that's the challenge, probably the biggest challenge that I've faced so far. All right. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, I know for a fact that you have, you have worked in a uh, lots of projects like uh, simulation projects, game projects, and software engineering projects. And you have all, also you have gone to USA. You have done a semester exchange program, I guess, in Tessie University from in the UK. Uh, you are in U India. So, what's 
it's like to be in a different cultures like uc davis tesid uh, srm what's the different culture okay um, so there are multiple questions in that but uh, for the first part of it um worked on multiple projects yes so um, last semester we got to build this amazing alternate controller project uh, that was called coscoroba and um, to our on uh, to our surprise it was a massive success by the end when we had to deliver it so that i worked in a team with 12 people out there uh, so just you know getting everything uh, from the start till the end so an alternate controller game is essentially where you build a controller itself from scratch and then yeah, you design the game based cool. on that yeah that's really so uh, so the thing about the one i would say one nice challenge that we had was that you know we had to build a controller and a game based off the controller so we were not allowed to use any traditional joystick keyboard mouse or uh, any of those traditional inputs but rather we had to use our own sort of inputs for that and with that i would say that it got all our minds thinking and as to saying how much of you know how much do we want the player to experience and stuff and another thing that definitely came up in there like I was mentioning was scope saying that you know we have four months time how much time we want do we want to spend on the controller and how much time do we want to spend working on the game itself so that game gave me a lot of exposure in terms of working because uh, i was one of the producers but rather than just being a producer i also worked on ux design for that game and i that was the first time i actually worked on game cinematics too so all the trailers and all the promotional material that were made were made by me just experimenting in unreal engine and um, you know a lot of people really liked it because they felt that they got a cinematic experience by just looking at the trailer and uh, yeah uh, it, i i felt it, that it was, it was so nice it was so nice when i was interviewing vishal and he mm -hmm. showed me i was i was like wow i i cannot uh, like it was a really great opportunity for me to be there and that's the reason actually i deferred in first place because i want to do that all the stuff with in person so that's the kind of stuff you you guys have inspired me to do i would definitely say that you know working in person is much better because just because you have the team vibe i would i, I don't know how to describe it but there's just a team vibe that exists when you work in person out there but um, you know even though that we did have that transition of you know not working uh, in person we did manage to still come up with an amazing product towards the end of it um so that's coscoroba but apart from that i also work at the research lab which so i would say that you know the main difference between working um on a game made for entertainment versus a game at the research lab is that we build a product that goes out to real world people where they use it as an application so the simulation stuff that we were talking about earlier is um, a part of a three software project that is used by real world people to solve real world solutions so we don't so our target audience out there is not based on people who you know use it for entertainment but rather who people who use it for educational purposes or people who use it for you know a practical solving a practical solution problem in your life um versus that at coscoroba that was something that we built for entertainment so essentially i would like to say that the main difference between working at these two places that i find is that uh, you know our target audience is different so the entire way that we approach like you know just designing the product and even the way we deliver it in terms of you know how much of uh, enthusiasm i would say as we put into it like you know this for the entertainment side of it we're all like okay this game is amazing and fun you should try it out but for the product side we need to explain to them as to why this product is going to solve a specific problem in their life so just working on those two sides has given me a good exposure on as to how there are two different just segments in the industry one which is dedicated towards serious stuff but the other which is also for entertainment and i would say i really like working on both of those um now coming to the uh, yeah go ahead sorry yeah like uh, i was i was just thinking that uh, both are two different projects and uh, like different mindsets different kind of people different kind of main uh, the main stuff is the different audiences uh, you guys have made the uh, like a uh, virtual home simulator i guess uh, for the social work, the training of the social workers and i i saw that i uh, saw that in a gap lab uh, website and i also saw that that uh, coscoroba the alternate control experience so th those two different mindsets like you are like i know for a fact that you are in a uh, like you are in the pivotal point of all those people so how can you like 
how can you explain the people or the people in your team that what can be done and what cannot be done like what's the process of total process like what the first phase second phase third phase is that is that any kind of stop in this okay uh, that's a really well brought up point actually so we do have this uh, phase that we before we start out with any project called a design box that we implement so out there we kind of list saying that okay there's going to be the technology that we deploy it for um, so let's say like it's going to be windows or mac or it's going to be vr or phone uh, and then after that we do have a target audience and then we have like a problem statement that we're trying to solve and the fourth one is just going to be like aesthetics of the game so when we you know set the constraints for these four sides of it we are forced to think what we can you know just between the box and what we can think um, with these four constraints so essentially when we come up with a final design for that we make sure that it fits all the four constraints that we have set initially and with that you know like so it's just not like you know only the producers or the designers are involved but the entire team is involved in this process so when we start off with this phase itself we make sure that everybody kind of aligns themselves towards what they're going to be working on or what their approach is going to be or who their target audience is going to be just with that i think when we make sure that we kind of fit it within these constraints people immediately begin to change their minds saying that okay i need to work on something that is serious and you know deliver it in such a way or i need to work on something that's fun and make sure that people really enjoy it while playing so all that's right. kind of the main process difference that it goes on between both yeah all right all right all right i i get it i get it now like uh, as i have said like uh, these these stuff are really really hard like uh, and uh, you have been exposed into different cultures and uh, different kind of industries in different countries like uh, is that uh, help you uh, made we a uh, made like being a better producer okay uh, so just to give a little bit of background i did my undergrad in srm but uh, in my third year i did get a chance to go to uc davis to study a semester abroad out there so at that time i was kind of focusing just on engineering aspects of it right so uh, i was looking into stuff like web development computer networks and stuff and i really got hard and training i mean like you know working to become like a computer engineer like i mentioned at that time i did not know like what a role of a producer was or even who a producer was and out there i did so the one big cultural difference out there that i first noticed was that you know the professors and the students so like the students can come and leave at any time in the class it's not that you know if you if your time if your class is from like 6 to 9 in the evening you have to be there all throughout people just come in at 7:30 and leave at like 8:30 but you know that kind of gave me the thing understanding that okay even though that you're not going to be physically present in class it's just the work that you do outside that really matters and contributes towards like you know completing your assignments and stuff just make sure that you're understanding what's going on in the course is kind of what even the professors expect and even what you are expected to do so that was kind of like i was going in the terms like okay i need to make sure that i do my class work and everything on time but then in my second so i did spend two quarters out there which is equivalent to like i would say a semester so my second quarter out there i kind of got a little more comfortable uh, studying out there so i did uh, take up this um, optional course that was called uh, you know game platforms it was a really fun course because that was kind of the starting point to my uh, game development experience i would say as where i got to work on like games with teams and also i got an amazing professor out there who kind of you know set the path for me to become a producer as to where i am right now i kind of went to him and told him that you know i'm really interested in doing this uh, game uh, stuff for my future but i just don't know which path to go to because now i'm an engineer but i kind of like the way that you know people present and stuff on stage and he said well there is a role for that which people are known as producers where they are kind of like a person like the front face of the project in in some cases so i was like okay and i did eventually after that i came back to chennai i had an amazing experience out there at uc davis just because it was the first time away from home i've not stayed like you know outside home in a hostel and stuff so it was the first time that i had to manage everything on my own from laundry cooking and just living by myself and managing cash so i've never done i'd never done that and and my first experience was an international one with a cultural change so i kind of got you know adjusted to that a little bit and uh, again when i came back in my fourth year for my final semester i got a complete scholarship to go to this uh, university in uk called tee side where i did so they they are a university that is completely dedicated they have a completely dedicated gaming department as well and in that place i went and did a, a vr project um 
called Space Get Away, which was, uh, again, like, it was the first time that I was experimenting in VR, but it became a really huge success because I've always been fond of simulation, space, military, and all those genres. So I kind of yeah, went yeah, into that absolutely. and tried it out. I tried, kind of went out and tried that, but, and it became a real amazing experience. But since that was the time, I just went for my final year project. I also got exposed to other stuff. So I, uh, one of the things that I really loved doing out there was I had my own radio show in the UK college network out there. So every week from Tuesday to Thursday, I, I mean, on every week on Tuesday from two o'clock to four o'clock, I used to talk about technology, what are the updates going on? And essentially out there is where I kind of found that, okay, I'm more comfortable with talking as itself, like presenting on live uh, radio and stuff. So. I got that exposure as well from there. And uh, one thing I forgot to mention was in UC Davis, I also took up a course on dramatics. Before that, I was a person who was very scared to, you know, go up on stage and present and, you know, even just be comfortable on stage. But that course really turned my, um, you know, uh, perspective over because I got much more confident in presenting up in front of stage in on the stage, as well as, you know, just making myself look more confident and presentable. So I think that uh, dramatic course really helped me out there, but, uh, and also this radio stuff, which really kind of, you know, pivoted my path saying that, okay, as you will do good as a producer, maybe because you're kind of confident one in this presentation, but also what you're learning right now in software engineering has helped you gain a good background as to what essentially a producer will do. So I think both these experiences have really changed my life as, in terms of my perspective as well, um, just because I got a good exposure outside just to what a regular, you know, um, person would get, I would say, I mean, uh, not that way, but I would say that, you know, I would, I got a better exposure uh, just, be, just to make sure that I kind of understood what else the world has to offer that. All right. All right. Uh, actually, um, like I, I, like I searched for game production, like YouTube, uh, Google everywhere. And mm -hmm. never ever I got a complete answer like that. Never. <laughs> like I, I even, I even couldn't even found a single interview of a game producer in YouTube. And even if I found it was like, it was in the Ubisoft, it was in French and no one had this clear idea. Everyone is like, I'm doc, I'm walk, I work, walk and talk with people and that's it. Nothing else. This is the complete answer. And uh, I, I also have uh, like my, this, this is my show and uh, mm -hmm. how, maybe how much uh, little it is, but there are some fans who have uh, made some questions for you. It's okay. like uh, they, they were uh, very interested in uh, like the difference between uh, like MBA in uh, game development, like that we have in Utah, uh, Utah game development MBA, I guess dual mm -hmm. degree and uh, what's the difference between game production they were very interested uh, in that question so uh, if you can answer that okay so i'm not so the mba is a dual degree that you can take up with the ea program so there is a specific type of mba for that uh, essentially if you've taken game production as your track in your masters you have the option to take a three-year course that is two years of ea plus one year of the mba degree and you will be graduating in three years. But uh, since I'm not taking it up exactly, I'm not entirely sure uh, on what it has, but I can say as for game production itself, we go through four semesters that in our masters, right? So the first semester we kind of learn exactly because all of us are new to this field. We kind of have a nice foundation course as to what game production is and you know how, just how to become a better personality for your, yourself. So, you know, encounter others like I would say to like you know talk to your peers in terms of like you know under getting what they require and also like you know managing a team when there's conflicts because um, some of the things that I did learn in that class really helped me out all throughout my semester um, and I did face those real world issues that we just discussed about as a hypothetical case in our class and I did know how to approach them so I would say that course gave me a good understanding and a better information on what it is to become a producer. And then in the second semester, right uh, in the last uh, last semester that we had, we had, uh, so we had level design probably as, one, uh, as I could term it. And that course gave us the entire exposure to the art pipeline um, that is there. So right from the start of making a model, like, you know, th planning about it with reference material, making the model, and then all the way to ending up with designing a level with which like, 
everybody else's stuff that what they work on as well. So that course gave us an amazing exposure to understand what the process actually happens in the game industry. So just to put together that you would get um, like by just doing the game production course, I would say you get all what is required for you to go out of the industry and apply to become a game producer. But with the MBA, I would say that because it, it does involve a lot of stuff like, you know, MBA does involve a lot of stuff like analytics and other stuff as well. So you do get a chance to become exposed as a product manager out there, a person who's more towards data handling and more towards um, what else is there? So more more towards data handling and analytics and stuff. I would yeah, say yeah, I, is I, I what is finance, with. accountancy, uh, and yeah, finance, MBA, uh, uh, yeah, like yeah. management so, and all the stuff, marketing and, and all those stuff. Yeah. So I mean, I would say that probably what comprises of a regular uh, MBA plus, uh, I guess, what is focused more towards on towards the side of the games, you can probably learn all that because a product manager essentially, like what I was saying is a person who handles analytics, who handles uh, budgets, and then who handles stuff uh, like marketing as well sometimes. So you do get exposed as a product manager when you probably go there versus a producer who's actually involved in the core functionality of the game when you work as a game producer. Yeah. All right, all right. Uh, so uh, actually that's that clears the confusion uh, all of the people have. And uh, I, I honestly had that same confusion because uh, you know, we engineers, uh, and I, I don't, I don't even uh, regret saying that we like to have much more uh, degrees and knowledge about this kind of stuff. And some of the time in India, actually, uh, people from engineering background would like to go for PhD or MBA for like a uh, other degree other than masters. So they were like uh, asking me, uh, what about MBA? What about PhD and this stuff? And I'm bro, I don't even know. Uh, I will let you know after this episode uh, and uh, these will be the perfect person to say all this. So thank you for uh, clearing that up. Uh, so oh, now uh, talk yeah. about, uh, now let's talk about the producer uh, part. Like you have talked about producer part, but uh, now I would like to talk about like you are a podcaster as well and uh, as mm -hmm. much as i have inferred that you were in the uk and you have that live radio show you are kind of trying to make your personal brand uh, do you like uh, do you watch gary b's uh, content no i do not watch uh, gary b's content no but uh, just to give a little bit background on that i did like you know so before i did the game stop show i would so i'm a person who's really interested in technology all throughout i've been like from my childhood and i did start off by having a blog where i wrote about stuff in the year 2015 because that's when i kind of gained confidence that okay i can do it and then i started off by having a youtube channel as well which was called ask kg tech and i did post some content out there but i was not very regular with it just because i did not have the exposure to the technology at that time um, because I used to see all these amazing YouTubers and be like, okay, these people have access to all the top technology. But uh, I used to pro like uh, the only way I used to get mine was if my friends bought new devices or, you know, if like somebody in the house bought a new device. So I would did not get them get much of an exposure with that, but I did definitely learn a lot just to become a little bit comfortable on camera and to, you know, know what I was saying at that time types. Uh, then fast forward to 2019 is where I did go to the UK. And I, I knew I would probably have a little bit of time because I went there for about five months and I was like, okay, apart from my project, I need to do something else to be a little more sane. So I was like, okay, so I went up and the, that's when these people from the radio, the university radio, like, you know, came and gave a presentation to the entire class. And I just told them that I was kind of interested to do this, just to, you know, try it out. So I did sign up for that. And then I went and, you know, just told them that this is my idea and this is what I want to do. And they were very like, you know, encouraging people. So I started off and that was one time, like probably the, that Tuesday between two and four, it was like towards my creative side. I would be like, okay, I need to try and come up with new things. I need to find a way to become more, you know, presentable, make the audience more engaging and fun. So I kind of did that for about, um, as I would say eight episodes overall at the time I was there and people really loved it. I mean, I would say that I got a chance to work at an international radio station, as well as the chance to, you know, present myself and just become more better with presentation in a live audience, uh, to a live audience. And um, because of that, right now, I was like, okay, I'm kind of bored at this time, especially after my course got over. 
I was like, okay, so I just experimented with starting this podcast and it's gone really well. All right. Uh, so it's, it seems like uh, quarantine have made us both uh, got out of our uh, comfort zone and try new things, right? Uh, yes. So, so I would say the reason I started Games Talk Show uh, was, uh, so I have two specific reasons for it. One, as I said, I wanted to become, as a producer, I wanted to become more confident while presenting. So I was like, okay, with this, I'm going to be talking to new people who I don't even know. Uh, I mean, considering that that would happen because at that time I was very clueless about what I was going to do. So I was like, okay, if I get a chance, I'm going to go talk to new people who have never spoken to before. And that 20 minutes with them is all that I get. And I need to make sure that I can extract as much as information that I require while making myself more presentable. So that was one goal behind it. But the other goal was that, you know, so uh, the game developers conference that happens every year, this time it was canceled because of COVID-19. And yeah, it was in that online. Is, so I, I attended the online and it was not as good as I thought because the, all the crowds and all the stuff in San Francisco, I guess, it was missing the vibe. Exactly. Right. So I was like, okay, uh, I kind of missed out on that. And that was probably one of the biggest chances to connect with people in the industry. And a lot of my friends also had that same, um, you know, thought that, okay, we're going to really miss out on connecting with people from the industry. And um, with, with EAE having such an amazing network, I kind of approached our career uh, advisor and I asked him, I was like, you know, would people just be interested to tell, uh, to spend a few minutes to just tell me about what their role is or, you know, what, what they, how the day-to-day life is and probably what advice that they would give to people who want to join their role in the industry. So he said, I think that they would be fine with it. So I kind of approached my professor first because uh, he's an amazing person who was the first semester who helped me out with uh, actually to where I am right now as a producer is all thanks to him. So I kind of approached him and he works at WB Games here in Salt Lake City and he's been working for seven years out there. So I was like, okay, no other better place to start than him. So I started off by just talking to him and, you know, understanding about his role and stuff. And I was a little more free in in approaching him just because I knew him personally. And that episode went amazing. Like a lot of people actually gave amazing reviews for it and said that, you know, really, they really gained a good understanding from it. And I got a little more confident from that. And I went on to the second and then the third, and then it eventually just built up to like nine episodes throughout that. Um, so I would say that, you know, I've made nine amazing connections right now that I can approach at any time and just get their help whenever I require. And, you know, also try and tell like, you know, because this industry works completely on connections and the more connections you have, the more you're known to people. Right. So I would say that, you know, these nine people would really help me out in terms of any issues that I have or any creative stuff that I want them to help me out with these nine people I can really approach at any time. So I feel that, you know, I've achieved both my goals with that just because I have um, become a little more confident, I would say, as well as I have uh, connect, made connections that I wanted to make as well. All right. All right. Uh, actually, uh, the moment I connected with uh, you in LinkedIn and you mm-hmm. posted the first episode, I literally jumped and listen mm-hmm. to that uh, episode and after that i am your uh, it's like i am one of the biggest uh, fan of your show oh, uh, thank you i have listened every episode uh, uh, like uh, that the guy name was troy johnson i guess uh, from that's, uh, right. that's then, my professor yeah that's that's your profession right uh, and then uh, utkarsh uh, and then uh, uh, the last last was i guess uh, lily gardner yes lily, uh, lily, uh, pretty, yeah 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 so i have listened every episode every episode mm-hmm. and uh, it was kind of like uh, an eye opener for me because i didn't have any idea that what i'm going to do with my podcast what it uh, what it takes to create uh, and it gave me a re- really good idea and i changed my brand all around industry people who are not who are not really getting the fame but working so hard and and doing something valuable to the audience so that's around i'm making this uh, podcast is about uh, so uh, like it's it's very hard for me to convince and honestly i'm a little bit insecure that they might not even text me back so how can you convince those people and how can you uh, like approach them to text you back and give your uh, like kind of a, a pitch that okay come to my show i'm doing this okay right so uh, when i started the game stock show i was just myself and i did not have 
any idea on what I was going to do. I did not. I was, so I was initially thinking that, you know, I'll probably tell them the game's news, what's happening every week. And then I will see because there was no guarantee that I could get anybody on my show. And I was like, okay, let me just try and approach. So I knew that the first person who would not say no to my show was my professor because he he's really understanding of this. And I approached him and I was like, do you want to, are you interested in this? And only after he said yes, I kind of, I, I, so I had the entire brand idea, everything in mind. And only after he said, yes, I kind of launched everything um, to where it is. So I told him that, you know, this is my idea and what I have. And um, these are probably the questions that I'll ask you on the show. And he was really happy with it. And the worst part was the first time that I recorded, none of his answers got recorded on the show. And it was very Same embarrassing. Same thing happened to, to me. Same thing happened to me. Like I forgot to record, uh, like I record the whole episode in the first episode and the, the, there was no sound. Same thing happened to me. Yeah. So I was like, I called him. So we have this uh, other thing that we use called Slack as well, apart from Zoom. So uh, on Slack, I was like, okay, I'll set him up on audio call and just because I was not planning to do video at that time. So I just set him up on audio call and I was like, okay, I'll record it. And after I had the whole 20, 25 minutes worth of interview, I played back and I can hear only myself. And that was very embarrassing at that time. So I just texted him <laughs> saying that, okay, so this did not work out. Are you free to try it again? He's like, yeah, sure. No problem. So we tried it out again and that worked out amazing because he was as spontaneous and as, you know, he was just as he was the first time as surprised when every question came and he answered them exactly as like, you know, like he was answering it for the first time. So when I started that off, it was like that. But then after that, I, by the time I had already emailed my uh, advisor saying that, you know, I'd like, I, I'd like for some people to come on. So the second person who actually came on my show, he asked if he could be in the interview. So I was like, okay, great. Like, I know that it's kind of getting a reach right now. So I interviewed him as well. But uh, one thing that I did was every week, I made sure that I had a guest for the following week because I did not want that tension when I'm releasing on Monday saying that, okay, I have nobody to, uh, you know, interview for the next week. And as I kept going on, people themselves started coming and approaching me. So I used to approach them via LinkedIn saying that, you know, I'm so-and-so person, I'm doing a master's right now, but I would like to connect with you just to understand, just take 20 minutes of your time just to understand what your role is and what your you know, experience is working in the industry. And because I've been in the industry for some time, what your advice would be for, to some people who are applying for the first time. So a lot of people actually were uh, hyped by the idea and they got on board and um, that's how it became to nine episodes, I would say. All right, like uh, I actually got an idea for myself as well uh, because uh, that's what I'm going tonight and uh, putting uh, like a message like that uh, maybe a note with that and put my channel and other episodes with that and tell them if they can come actually uh, it's a little bit insecure for me because like it was for you because I was thinking about uh, interviewing you for a long time but every time I was thinking I was thinking that He's a game producer. He is doing this much uh, podcast. He's much more experienced than me. And I don't even know what a game production is. So what I'm going to talk about. And uh, finally, I'm glad that I, like, at least I told and you agreed. Uh, so thank you so much for that and ideas. Uh, so that's kind of like, that's the thing. I have insecurities and I don't know how can you, uh, like, like, overcome that. Right. Okay. So again, the first step I would say is to just approach because you have nothing to lose in the end. Okay. Like eventually I was like, okay, if, and, and even my career advisor told me this on campus, right? So he was like, see, uh, you know, you can approach all these great people, but you know, in the chance that nobody, everybody says, no, you can interview your friends. You can interview people who you work with because they're essentially a connection as much as anybody else in the industry is because you're kind of working in the same game space. So I was like, okay, but he was like, see, your point of doing this is to just make sure that you're more confident while presenting. So just go ahead and do that. You can interview your professors as well. Like they would be on board with it. I said, okay, but then I just gave it a shot. I was like, okay, what if, so because, because my first episode had a person who was like that experienced, I would say that that got a, a huge impact for other people to come in as well. So like people, so a couple of episodes, I interviewed people who have just been working there for probably less than a year, but I felt that anybody's experience out there was as valuable as a person who's been working there for like centuries because um, you know, a person who just joined the industry has a set of fresh eyes saying that, okay, this is how I applied and this is what helped me get through. And a per that would have been very different from when a person applied probably like, you know, 10, 12 years ago in the games industry, because the industry was completely different back then. So just taking the leap and, you know, 
like approaching as many people as you can and probably you know just making sure that you get that you send a message saying that this is what i want uh, from you from your time uh, that would really help out because that's the one thing that i did i just made sure that they understand what i exactly required and told them that i not going to be requiring anything else so i'm not a person who asked them about you know what game is coming up next can you tell me insights on what you're working on and stuff because i know that that's a part of an nda and that would really like you know i, I would just become another person who works on something like game spot or uh, ign and stuff because i'm not a person who's interested to find out what they're working on uh, i mean i am interested but then i just don't want them to be like you know i'm here only for that but i'm here for them as an individual and not for them as a company so i think that's what help people understand that okay it was a little bit different and got them on board and just made sure made them confident that saying that okay even if i come on the show it's not going to be like violating my uh, company's pr policy and stuff and uh, that's kind of how i got people on board as well all right all right uh, absolutely uh, i will i will do that like i will do that tonight i will do that tonight as like it was a really eye opener for me and uh, coming from you who have interviewed such great people with that much of experiences really uh, actually it inspires me uh, so like uh, so com- coming to the next question uh, like uh, like do you have a long term goal for your podcast like what's your long term goal like do you want it uh, to be like there is other shows who want it to be uh, just niche like uh, there's lex redman's ai podcast who is just on uh, ai and other stuff uh, do you want it to be the totally for games and simulations or do you like it to uh, combining it other stuffs like actors who have already interviewed an actor and uh, people who are working on mocap do you in, uh, in, are you interested in that part as well So right now I I mean when I started off I did not have any goal for it I just wanted to make sure that I could get people to talk about their experience and with that the target that I was I mean the audience that I was targeting was obviously students and people who are fresh to the industry um so right now I am in the process of transitioning between from audio to video just because I am kind of more comfortable with audio right now and I want to venture into the video platform space so I'm transitioning my podcast from audio to a video podcast and by the end of it what I want again is something like you know there there are a lot of late night talk shows but I want to try and have like a late night show for games specifically thing that you know where people can come in and I can talk to them and where it can be a little more free in terms of you know what we discuss in terms of their daily life or uh, working in the industry but the core thing that i still want to achieve is try and talk to as many different people as i can in the industry from different studios just to understand what their role is and if that role would help somebody like you know if that episode can help somebody determine which role they want to go into the future so i just want to make sure that i kind of reach a better i mean reach more audience as well as reach more people just to come on the show and make a little more of a fun time when they come on the show as well yeah it's 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 really important for me to connect with people as well because um, because i am a people person i like to talk with people i i like to share their journeys their ideas and it doesn't matter where they are coming from because each and every one has a great journey despite their success and failures and what the, the main reason i've started this show because i have seen the only people only like interview those people who has the millionaires or billionaires or entrepreneurs and no one is actually talking about like how the game is made how the engineering is going on how the production is going on or the maybe the data science or artificial intelligence what's the thing what's the people behind the scenes are doing no one is talking about that and no one really cares about those people so uh, it's kind of like a like it kind of like a market for me it's it's no one is going for that so i thought i could do that as well so that's kind of a long term goal for me so uh, do you have a long term goal for uh, like your like obviously you have you have told us about your podcast but do you have a long term goal for uh you as a producer or do you like to be a product manager in the later part of your career 
Um, so there are three things that really interest me right now. One is user experience. One is being a producer. And the third one is doing cinematics because I really enjoy it. So every time a new game trailer is launched, I, I get really excited just by the way, you know, how they present their trailer in terms of a cinematic and in terms of, you know, how beautiful their view is and how they bring in audience for that. So these three things are something that really interests me right now. But so uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm really interested in technology and I've been since a child when I was a child, right? So I used to follow all these keynotes given by companies like, you know, Apple's WWDC every time and every time they launch a phone, Google's develop keynote and their pixel launch and stuff. So I used to be really interested in that. And I was like, okay, someday in the future, I really want to be that person who is like the face of the product. When I go up in front and present to the public, I want like, you know, I want them to believe that, okay, what I'm presenting is really going to buy. I mean, it's really going to make them buy the product as well. So I really started following stuff like um, those keynotes. Excuse me. Yeah, so I started following stuff like those keynotes as well. And uh, like that has really inspired me to be like, okay, this is the path that I want to go on. So essentially I want to become a person who rises to the rank saying that, okay, I'm presenting stuff in front of you right now. And so I get to look, take that responsibility up. But apart from that, my other goal that I would like to have is just, you know, work with, not just work with um, like, you know, um, the regular teams that are there in the game development, but also work with some other type. Like, you know, I would like to go out there and see what the front, like, you know, the users are experiencing as well. So like, I would like to, for me to understand, like, you know, what goes in, a, in their mind when they, like, you know, click this button or when they do use this certain mechanic or press this button and stuff, right? So I'm kind of curious on what that is going to be as well. That kind of fills fills my user experience part of it. But um, as a producer for me in the long term, I would just like to be the one who goes up on stage and says, okay, this is our new game. Uh, buy it when it comes out. Types. Like kind of like a Steve Jobs in the keynote. I would say I was really inspired by Steve Jobs and right now Tim Cook as well, just because, you know, they have that power of saying that, okay, this is what you've made and um, go ahead and buy it out because we know that it's going to be the best. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just because it's not just a product. It's what you do with that product. It's that their charisma and uh, the vision of that product, what it can be, what it should be for the people. And uh, I have absolutely, uh, absolutely certain about one thing that you are one of you are kind of one of them because you are totally uh, audience centric like you are talking about the end people who are actually thinking and you kind of like a reverse engineering those stuff and as well so uh, that's that's really great and uh, I am really glad that we are having this conversation and uh, people who are going to see this will have much more values from that so uh, like I have a few other questions as well but uh, I would like to thank you uh, in advance for coming to this show because it's absolutely stunning. And, uh, and for me, it's just a third episode. Uh, and it's, it's kind of like, I was thought it will be really hard to talk with someone who has much more experience than me, but you have made this process so easy for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, yeah. I mean, no, it's, it's just that I like talking to people. I'm like very comfortable. I'm, I'm trying to get there where I'm very comfortable with it. So I would definitely like, you know, grab the opportunity when somebody says that they want to talk to me and, you know, just help them with whatever I know. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, like uh, coming to your producer, like uh, I could say your producer, what can I say? What is, what is that word? I don't even know. Uh, well, let me say your producer part of your life uh, do you have any advice for the people who are actually thinking about going into a production part do you like do you recommend them for going for a masters or do you want them to start directly into the game industry um so there are two routes to it right so the games industry as far as i know works on experience so if a person so a, a producer is actually a person who's built an experience because they kind of are the person who has that division and you can tell people that, okay, this is the direction that we want the project to go towards. So that comes, I would say with experience, which I kind of lacked at the first because I just came straight out of undergrad to uh, my masters, but there were some people in my program who've had experience, not so much just in the games industry, but even like, you know, with different industries, just a work experience, which kind of gave them a better knowledge as to, okay, how a product uh, development works. 
So I would say that there are two routes, but um, I, since I wanted my first job to especially be as in the games industry itself, I decided to complete my master's and you know get that educational experience as well and start off as an intern and then go up all the way to actually becoming a producer. But there are other ways itself. So the people I've interviewed have also said that, you know, it does not matter that you start off in the games industry. All that matters is that you get the experience. So there have been people who have been writers, there have been people who have been like, you know, on the marketing side and who've done economics and stuff. So a producer role is not just contained, like saying that you need to have the complete technical knowledge for it. So there are technical producers to do that. There is a space where everybody can come in and, you know, contribute towards becoming a producer as well. So their specialties can help also. Like if somebody's really good at business, they can do the product, they can become a product manager in the games industry. But I would say that, you know, uh, if you have the chance to gain experience, then definitely that would really help your resume stand out because I can see that, you know, when I apply for a job there, there, if there's somebody who's had even a little more experience than me, they would obviously prefer them because they kind of know how stuff works in the industry. But um, if, but that doesn't mean that, you know, your profile is always discouraged because you also work on some things that you gain the foundational knowledge as to what people who have just, who probably just joined the industry without knowing what it was did, right? So you have a better knowledge on how stuff works and that sometimes can help as well. So it essentially, it would depend on you uh, if you want to, you know, go directly into the games industry and gain, gain that experience a lot. Or if you want to try and pursue another route with say, okay, I want to know what it exactly is and then how I can become better at it and then join the industry. So I chose the second route because I was like, okay, I want to make sure that I know what I'm doing and not just jump into it. Yeah, it's 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 kind of like the same stuff, uh, like exactly the same reason I'm going for a game engineering or an MS because I... Honestly, uh, there are other courses where you can learn engineering and uh, in this era, in the digital era, uh, you really can learn a lot of stuff by yourself in home. But I really wanted to know what I'm doing before I'm going to the industry. So that's the kind of stuff. And uh, being in India, you don't have really much more exposure in a AAA, working at a AAA game company, uh, working on a big project. So uh, I guess that's one of the reasons in that. Uh, so what's the, what's the, like, that was kind of like my reason and uh, you have said uh, what a beginner can do. So what could be like their portfolio piece? Like we have engineers who have the codes, artists who have the, all the stuffs and arts, what would their portfolio of a producer? So this is exactly the same question that I asked when I was interviewing a producer as well, a couple of episodes back. Uh, so the one thing that for a producer, your uh, people, skills matter as well a lot. So, I mean, I do have a website where I kind of post saying that, okay, this is what I worked on. And the one thing that I did from the start, so I don't know if it was just to send to my parents or what, but I started doing this where I recorded every single pitch that, you know, I presented in front of our audience out there. So I kind of gave people a perspective saying that, okay, I'm kind of confident in presenting as well. So one of the roles of being a producer, but that did not completely account to what the other roles are supposed to fulfill, like, you know, project management and, you know, tra tracking the bugs and stuff. So I would say that as a producer, what I've learned is that your LinkedIn really matters because that's where you present yourself as an individual uh, to other people who are potential employers. And also your, I think that stands out a lot. And then your, um, what you put in your portfolio. So stuff like your one sheet is what sells the game, right? So that kind of really matters on what you put out there. And you can probably put out some documentation, what you've written through the game, like a game design document that you write, just to make sure people that make sure that people understand what your um, background is, or you know, where you come from, and also what your approach is going into that design document, because there are a lot of things that can go in, but what is most important is the only thing that needs to go in, right? So it can give people an understanding of that, but I would say that your resume with experience stands out the most for a producer's portfolio. All right, so you, the producers totally the stuff that totally goes for like the people skills and the experiences and the, the stuff they work with other people so that uh, the industry can uh, infer that okay, this person can be right for our system for our environment and they can manage people to make sure that we can ship a successful game. So that's that's right, right? 
Correct. So it, it, it's like, okay, I'm hiring this person. So it, it differs between a AAA and an indie studio, but would usually, as far as what I've heard from AAA, it's that if they hire you, it's going to be for that specific role. So if you fulfill that role and, you know, you complete their interviews and requirements with like, you know, what they expect, then they're like, okay, so you're the right fit for that person. So, I mean, you're the right fit for that role, but also just what you do to get there. So in terms of your portfolio, I would say it's like, fill in what exactly you've done just to make sure that they understand, okay, that you have experience in all this and you've worked in all this already. So that would be the selling point for you to get the first step of like, okay, the email saying that, okay, we are interested in your, uh, you know, in you in hiring you. So here is our test or here is going to be a phone call interview just to, you know, get to know you. So I would say you putting like your wordings really matter on what you put on in your resume and also how you present yourself in the first interview call. All right, all right, uh, and uh, that's that's really answers my question. Uh, like uh, any last advice for viewers who are listening to this show, because uh, lots of you, lots of viewers uh, have no idea what a producer is, and you have cleared that, and uh, they might wanna know how to move forward with this. Do you have any advice for this? Uh, I would say so. I came here. Uh, I was not a person who used to play a lot of games. So my intent w- of this program was to like, you know, do simulation because I'm a person who has been interested. So I wanted to become a pilot at first, but then uh, after I had some eye restrictions, I was like, okay, I do not think that that's the route to go. I was like, okay, let me try this. Uh, let me try making games. But I did have this experience of a simulation where like, you know, there was an entire cockpit and I tried to make uh, like, you know, flight. Really like, uh, and- like military and drones and uh, like military. Yeah, I'm very, very interested with all those, uh, you know, space, military and aviation, because those three things, just to simulate the hard work that goes behind it and the simulation, like, you know, the end product of that is something that really, really inspired me to get get into that uh, role. So I was like, okay, even if I'm not able to do it physically, I want to help people who get, you know, in the future who want to use this um, like games and simulation for their training. So that's kind of where I started out with that. And I was not a person who played a lot of games, but I would say that, you know, if you not to fit in but i would say that if you want more ideas you know when you present or when you just when you talk to people a lot of people play games just to you know that that gives them an idea and saying that okay so this mechanic in this game was good so i would say that play a lot of games um you know understand them not just like not don't just play them for fun but understand them and analyze them saying that okay what you try and figure out why they would have done this or you know what made them choose to go this path specifically so that kind of will help you out in the initial phase of, you know, understanding, okay, like I want to pursue this route of becoming a game developer. And I really like these things that these games have done. So that's the first step. But then after that, it also matters. Like I was saying, this industry is built completely on connections, right? So connections, like connect to as many people as you can on LinkedIn. I know that there are, like I've reached out to a lot of people who have not, I mean, who have accepted the request, but then i tell them about the show, but I don't usually get a response from them. But there are some other people who are willing to help you out. So try and reach out to like, you know, if you reach out to 50 people, even if 10 or 12 of them respond, it's really going to help you out because you can tell them that this is what I'm interested in. I'm interested in getting into the games industry, but I'm kind of clueless on where to start. Those connections, just because they've been there in the industry, they can help you out saying that, okay, this is what I did. And maybe that can help you out. Like maybe it's not going to be the same process, but then it can probably help you out saying that, okay, this is what I need to do probably just to get into that first step. And uh, the other thing that I would say is, you know, understand what you want to do at first. So I kind of started off with the engineering part and then I was like, okay, well, I do enjoy this. I kind of enjoy uh, like, you know, being a people person a little more or, you know, presenting up on stage. So that's why I chose this production route. But there are other people who are like, okay, I really enjoy like making shaders and, you know, those like the match that goes behind the game and all those, like a little more of the VFX stuff. So people get into tech art, becoming a tech artist with that. So like, you know, understand what you want to do and start developing your, you know, entire portfolio piece based on that, because the number of portfolio pieces that you have is what determines on how much more better than you would be than another person. Like you can have a million, um, like, you know, um, pieces in there, I would say like, it also matters about quality. So uh, I would say that, you know, you can have a lot of pieces in there, but also the quality will stand on that. So try try and spend a lot of your time working on a portfolio piece just to make sure that, you know, you know that it's ready for um, sending out to people in applications as well. And uh, what else? 
as I would say, I wanted to know, like try and, you know, research on stuff that all these industry. So a lot of these job applications would really tell you that what software you need experience with. So I think that would be a really good starting point for you to just understand on what they require. And if you can get your hands on with our software or just, you know, learn a little more about it when you, and when you get the chance to use it a lot, I think that would really help you out. So as a producer, uh, a lot of people require you to have experience with something called Jira, which is a project management software. So like, you know, we all knew about this word that this word that existed, but none of us really had the experience with it. So when we got the chance to work with it, we've been taking, we've been utilizing it at every project that we can just to make sure that, you know, the person who's recruiting us is like, okay, this person has a lot of experience with Jira just based on the projects. So maybe that would be something different for an engineer or a tech artist. So like learn what is required in the industry and try and see if you can work on that from the start for you to get a better head start than the others. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I guess uh, these advices uh, will help uh, a lot of people who are, will see, li- see this. And uh, as this, you are one of the one of the first guests in this show. I guess people after like uh, maybe a year and a year and a half uh, will see this and they will understand how this industry works. And uh, as a game producer, it's like ma- most of the people know about game engineers and game artists and designers. and very few people know about game producers and thank you so much for making so clear about this game producers. I hope each and everyone gets so much value from this. Uh, so uh, you have said about portfolios and uh, obviously I also have a portfolio. Uh, so whenever you have time, you might uh, see that and tell me how, how have I did with that. So that's the kind of I can definitely tell you design wise, but you know, as an engine, I'm not very familiar with what an engineer requirement is, but I can help you to, I mean, I put you on with people with that for sure. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much for coming to the show. uh, And thank you so much. All these advices. Okay. For sure. Uh, See you. Good night.